Hello, everyone. And on behalf of World Affairs, we're glad to have you back for this virtual program on how we can rethink capitalism after COVID-19. We've all been sheltering in place here in San Francisco since the beginning of March, about eight months. And the good news is we just learned uh, this week about the developments on a vaccine that give us all great hope. It's also a historic week in that we uh, elected a new leadership uh, for the United States through our uh, presidential elections. So we now are looking at a transitional period. So this is a, a, a momentous moment uh, that's redundant, but it is an important moment. Uh, and we're, uh, we're certainly encouraged by some of the changes in the medical field that could bring an end to perhaps our sheltering in place. I'm delighted today uh, to introduce uh, our speaker. My name is Marcos Kunalakis. Uh, I'm a, the foreign affairs columnist for the McClatchy chain of newspapers, Miami Herald, and I'm also a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. With me today is Roger Martin, a uh, professor emeritus at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And he's the author of When More Is Not Better, Overcoming America's Obsession with Economic Efficiency. And that's his newest book. Here it is. Uh, it's really important to have a visual when you're going online to buy the book or visiting your local bookstore. It's, it's really terrific. And we'll be talking a lot about the things that um, Professor Martin has discussed, uh, has written about. Um, I encourage you to check it out after this program. The, the book is, as I say, available uh, on your at your favorite bookseller or online. Professor Martin also served as Dean of the University of Toronto from 1998 to 2013. And in 2013, he was named Global Dean of the Year. And that's quite a title. Uh, welcome, Roger. Uh, we're so glad to have you. Um, let me go into the theme since we said in our title that we're going to look at COVID. Um, you talk about the stresses that modern capitalism and the and the emphasis on efficiency that uh, that capitalist models uh, have created, but the but the stresses that this system puts on our democratic system and in particular in the United States. It seems that the latest stress test on our governing system and our society as a whole is COVID-19. And so I ask if the pandemic that we're facing provides a moment for us here and, and in the rest of the world to re-examine the problems that capitalism, late stage capitalism has presented uh, to our democratic system and namely, if this late stage capitalism is democracy's worst enemy. Well, I, you know, I, I think it, the COVID does, uh, I think you're, you're right, Marcus, and it, it does provide an opportunity to reflect and say, gee, uh, was our system prepared as well as it might be for it? And, and the answer is obviously not, but, but why and in what way? And in my view, we were more obsessed about efficiency in the system that would have helped with uh, deal with COVID than we were about the resilience of that system. And that's something I, that in, in the book I talk about is a more broad phenomenon, but it applied here where, and, and there are studies already coming out about how much hospital chains were cutting down nursing staffing to absolutely the bare minimum to make sure they were efficient, right? And that they didn't buy PPE, the stories in New York about New York State uh, uh, having a chance to buy a lot of uh, PPE the year before and said, no, no, that would be excess. We don't need our storerooms full of that. We don't need our working capital tied up in that. And those are both expressions of, we have to make sure we're efficient as possible by driving out any slack, any waste. The problem of course, is that when you have a bump in a curve, in this case, uh, you know, a, a, a pandemic that has lots more people coming to hospitals and, and hospitals needing the PPE, it's not there. And so I do think that that, that very obvious example of that, that phenomenon of, of driving efficiency to the point of having no slack and little or no resilience, hopefully will be you know, an object lesson so that we can at least learn something 
uh, from this crisis that would be a- applicable to the economy more broadly. Right. So this is really the question that you pose throughout your book, which is not strictly in the medical field, but across the board within our economic system, this drive towards efficiency and this model uh, of efficiency as the way that we uh, it's our operating system, really, within Mm. uh, within our um, economics, within our economic system, but also within our governing system that uh, it has these inherent pressures that will not deliver for us going forward. And, and you use some very specific periods. You say that it's, you know, it functioned quite well, this balance between an efficient capitalist system that, that brought us to prosperity and, and the like, uh, that, that suddenly somewhere around the 70s, mid 70s, that that system changed and, and that, that that change is threatening uh, both the middle class upon which our politics is 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 uh, looks towards as a foundation, um, and and that that break in fact has dramatic repercussions, potential repercussions on our politics and on democracy itself. Could you sort of walk us through a little bit of, about your thesis and and how that sure. how that functions? Sure. I mean, yours was a good yours was a, a good a good summary in that in that I, I argue in, in the book that for 200 years, arguably, the pursuit of more efficiency was good for America from 1776 to 1976 uh, at our bicentenary. Um, and the, the manifestation of that was that for as long as we can track uh, the average family in the in the country, that median family right in the middle of the dis- distribution moved ahead smartly uh, in terms of its prosperity in the overwhelming majority of the years. There was a long depression in the late 1800s and the Great Depression, and there'd be 75, 76, or 82, you know, individual bad years. But if you if you looked across that that vast uh, tract of of time, they were moving forward so much so that. Uh, from the time we were able to measure it really, uh, really eff- effectively through to uh, 1976, the median family could expect a doubling of its real income in a generation. So a family could sit around the table and say, our, our kids are, our, uh, chances are they're going to be twice as prosperous as, as, as we are uh, at the time they're, they're our age. Then, as you said, something changed and it changed in the 70s. I just picked 1976 in some sense as, as, as the year to f- focus on because it was the bicentenary, you could argue for a year earlier or a year later. But since then, the, the pace of increase in that median family's income has, has fallen to one quarter the previous. And the implication of that is that that, fa- that median family income only doubles in a hundred years right? Three and some generations uh, later. And why I think that's so problematic is, you know, in democratic capitalism, the swing voter is sort of my, my metaphor for them is the median family. Now, it might not be exactly the median family, but in that band around are the families that in some sense are going to vote in the, the, the next leadership in, a, in any election. And for 200 years, it is arguable that they had a reason to stick with democratic capitalism, a really powerful one. And since since uh, 1976, I think the reason for doing that has has declined in its in its power, thanks to something happening in the economy, which I argue is us pushing efficiency past the point of diminishing returns. Uh, and and what that's done is created a set of economic outcomes that's getting more and more extreme. Um, so, that, so that you'd say, well, why is median growth, median family income growth so anemic when economic growth since seven, uh, 1976 has been pretty good? It's not been outstanding, but it's been pretty good. The reason is increasingly economic growth and the fruits of it are going to the very top tail of the distribution, right? The very top, uh, top tail. So prior to 1976, if the economy grew by a dollar, the chance, the biggest chance is that dollar would end up in the lowest income person's pocket. 
as it turns out, statistically. And the probability of it ending in somebody's pocket decreased uh, the higher they were in the income distribution. And that's the kind of curve I think a lot of us would say, boy, I like that curve, right? Mm -hmm. It means the, the poorest families are catching up. What's, yeah. what's not to like? And the people who need it least, they're, they're, getting, they're getting kind of the least out of it, but, but they're doing fine because they need it least. That's reversed. By 2014, the curve had reversed entirely so that the lowest probability goes to the poorest family and the highest probability by far goes to the very, very, very richest uh, family. So we pushed efficiency to the point that we changed the fundamental payoff structure to the economy. And that's a threat, at least to, to my way of thinking, a threat to people saying, I'm gonna to continue to believe in this lovely, I think, combination of de democracy and capitalism. It's a compelling argument. Certainly you have the data to show and to prove it out. It's one that's reflected in our political sphere as well. The arguments that you've just made and the data that you've presented, for example, are the types of things that Bernie Sanders has been pointing out about the 1% and, and the inequality of distribution of wealth within the United States at the same time that those who are working are are uh, having less of an opportunity to catch up. But, you know, these are also arguments that were made by Karl Marx early on, that in <laughs> fact, these are the inherencies of a capitalist system. I mean, are, are you essentially just a modern day Marxist sort of <laughs> repackaging uh, yeah. this argument into a modern day environment where, where in fact we have a, uh, arrived at a, at a place where that inefficiency and that, or that efficiency but inequality has now uh, arrived? I mean, I have been called that uh, uh, from time to <laughs> I think to, I just called to... you it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but no, I, I, I would say, I would, my, my own interpretation of it would be to say that Karl Marx was definitively wrong, right? Uh, I mean, the, the prosperity of the people he was most worried about grew tremendously, you know, more so in, in America virtually than any other large scale uh, country. Um, that, having been, that having been uh, said, um, I think th we've just taken something too far mm -hmm. that if we could scroll back uh, to, to, to not a great degree, but just take off the extreme. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the extreme obsession that says things like, you know, I will be a better company if I can just get my labor costs down another point. I will be a better com uh, company if I can make sure I don't have any excess um, uh, salespeople on the on the uh, on the store floor in my in in my uh, store, mm -hmm. right? When we say that extreme thing, if we say more of what I've just described is always better, that's what's gotten us into trouble, where where the there's been a, just a lack of that sense of balance. And I think, I think if we restored, restored that balance, we'd once again demonstrate that, that Karl Marx you know, kind of was, not, was not right. You, you did not need a violent uh, revolution by the, by the proletariat to, to uh, enrich the, the proletariat to have them share equally in prosperity. And I would say the, the, the statistics in and around you know, kind of 1970, 1976, as I've been saying, said, actually they were they were doing very well uh, and the and the signs were positive was it perfect no you know was there you know a problem with wage differentials between men and women between uh, Caucasians and African Americans yes 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 it wasn't utopia on earth by any stretch but it was heading in the right direction until such time as we let this obsession uh, take over us and and started doing things that in many respects, if you just think as, as, uh, as, an, as a human being, if you happen to be a human being who is a CEO of a company, is it really natural and humanistic for you to say, in order to make sure I hit the number that the analysts have said we should be getting for this quarter, I need to fire 500 people who were doing a perfectly fine job, but I will just uh, declare them to be ex excess. It's not that they were doing a bad job. They were doing their job, but I need to make the two pennies more to make that quarter. 
I, I mean, I, I actually don't, I, I know lots and lots and lots of CEOs and executives, and I don't know many of them who'd say that's a natural human reaction. Uh, but what we have is a system that has said, no, that's, that's what you're supposed to do. You'll be more efficient uh, if you do that. Right. Uh, and obviously, when I talked about Marxism, I was being somewhat facetious. No, 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 I know it. I was uh, being back. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because when we've, we've had moments of time in the past when we've had pressures on a system that seemed to be unfettered, that had, uh, you know, essentially captured the state in some of the in some ways. And yet, when we got to that breaking point, the system reacted and and responded i think you know from my historical reading at least the uh development of a social security system the development of a new deal when when capitalism's you know worst egregious um excesses were were being uh explored and this is of course before this level of inequality that you've been, like right? 1935 like I, I i think a wonderful example of, of yours is the national labor relations act and the national labor relations board right that in my view was was a response uh a democratic response to uh companies being egregious about the way uh, the, the the way they were treating employees, so I agree. I agree, and that's I mean that, that to me is the wonder of of democracy, right? Which which yeah. is which is when when something goes kind of is heading over the edge or going over the edge, there is this response, and that was and that was in in my in my view, although you know there would be others who would say it was terrible, but in my in my view was was a a, a an excellent democratic response to to excessiveness and if we have a democratic response to excessiveness uh here i mean i i, I think that would uh, that would be a, a great thing and, and as i say i don't think it needs to be an overthrow of of anything in 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 particular as much as it me it, it needs sort of both a dialing back and in a different conception you know, I talk in the book about the conception of the economy mm -hmm. has become much more sort of technocratic. I think we've gone on on a technocratic kind of a vector uh, where we say it's sort of like a machine and we can get economists to, to say, well, if you pump this much money in, this uh, much will come out the, the, the other side. We can break it down into little chunks and optimize each, each one. And I think that's gotten us into ever more problems because it just isn't. And I think if you track, you know, how accurate economists are, macroeconomists and forecasting are, you, you have to come to the conclusion that, that the fundamental model they use is, is wrong. Blue chip economic forecasters, supposedly the 50 top economic forecasters in the US as late as December, 2008, forecast growth for 2008 the year they were th yeah. 11, 12 through as positive. Right. When in fact, it was one of the worst years in, in living, living history of, of, of the American uh, uh, economy. Um, so what we need to do is recognize it's not that, it's something different. And it's yeah. a, to me, it's a complex adaptive system, a natural system. It's more like the Amazon jungle than it is some, some kind of big input output m machine uh, and start treating it that way, uh, there aren't perfect answers. Mm -hmm. They're just tweaks you can make to tweak it in, in a right direction. And then you watch and see what happens and tweak it some more if you're heading in a good direction and stop tweaking it that way if you're heading in a bad direction. I, it, it doesn't feel as good to the technocrat who right. says, I want to get the right answer and do the right answer and then stick with the right answer. That's yeah. simply not how natural systems uh, work. Right. And, and so you're arguing for this holistic sort of natural, you know, uh, competitive adaptive system or rather um, complex adaptive system. And uh, and it makes sense. It, I, I, I followed your argument through the book. But uh, at the same time, your colleagues, uh, many of them economists, some of them within business schools where you've not only taught but led, 
seem to have really pushed in the opposite direction towards this understanding of economics as a science, as something that's that's really uh, hard and fast and in fact technocratic to a higher degree rather than becoming something that's much more holistic and reactive and, and adaptive, um, that in fact, you know, numbers become more important. In fact, within the academy itself, you find that economics sort of leads the social sciences in Absolutely. trying to, and pressuring other departments, whether it be political science and others, to try and be much more scientific, uh, rooted in, in facts and figures. Uh, so I see an inherent um, conflict both within your your uh, profession and 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 the academy and what it is that you're arguing for i i, I couldn't agree more uh, that that is right and and for me we've been on this vector uh for at least 50 50 years in the business school business it's been it's actually been 60 years there were two famous studies ford foundation and rockefeller or carnegie foundation uh, Sorry, studied business education in 1959-60 and came up with scathing reports saying it should be more scientific. Mm -hmm. And so it is headed in that scientific uh, direction because it was sort of slapped and, and told be more scientific and that, that ended up change, changing. But you know, the, the irony to me of all of this is it goes against the admonitions, the very, very clear admonitions of the father of science. So the father of science is actually Aristotle. 21, 2,400 years ago, Aristotle laid out the first, yeah, <laughs> laid out the first ways of the, uh, in, in the history of man, really, of how you could scientifically demonstrate, as he said, the cause of a given effect, right? He, he, he said, well, if you want to understand the cause of what we see happening, here's how you can study that uh, and be rigorous of, about that. And the world went into the dark ages for a while and then, and then came back in the scientific revolution and, and sort of formalized it. But what they ignored is something that he said in the very set of papers that, that, uh, that became that scientific manual. And he said, watch out, this method that I've shown you is for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Right, so that's yeah. the part of the world where if I drop this pen, I let go of this pen, it'll drop. Yes, it dropped ten years ago, hundred years ago, it'll drop a hundred years from now, it'll drop in Antarctica, it'll drop everywhere. Yeah. Right, and he said, in that part of the world, use my method. Why? It's because when you study the past data, and all data is in the past. Remember, right. we have no data about the future; it's all in the past. When you study that data, it's a good predictor of the future. Right, mm -hmm. but he said there's a whole nother realm of the world where things, as he said, can be other than they are, mm -hmm. right? right? Like, for, for example, you've got one of these, right? Yes. <laughs> and now if it's more than an arm's length away, you get the hives, right? <laughs> right? Well, you didn't get the hives in 1998 when it was more than an arm's length away because they didn't exist. 1999 was the first, uh, first smartphone, right? Um, that's the part of the world where things change, right? And what he said there is, don't use my scientific method. It'll give you the wrong answer, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he said, in that part of the world, your, uh, your job is to imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. The job of human beings there, he said, is to be the cause of a new effect. The entire social scientific world and much of the scientific world has ignored the father of science and is pushing science right, in a part of the world that it shouldn't be used in according to the guy who invented it. Um, and, and so you are right, the entire business school world is heading in a vector that is, that is not gonna be helpful to the world as it, as it uh, should be. Um, and the latest, you know, the latest craze on uh, artificial intelligence is, 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 a, is a big part of that. There's going to be a supernova blow up where when, when we finally figure out uh, that uh, Aristotle was right uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and that imagining futures and then making them, that's the, that is the artistry of, of uh, humanity. And the more we say, ah, ah, Marcos, that new thing you to told me about doing, 
I'll do it only if you can give me proof that it'll work. Right. It turns out, right, and another great philosopher, this American, Charles, Charles Sanders Peirce, is, uh, pointed out that no new idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically. Right. No new idea in the history of the world. So, so if I just ask you that simple question, hey, Marcus, just give me the proof before we do this. I'm asking you to do something that's never, ever been done and never will. Right. So, so you are, you are correct. You are correct. We've gone to this sort of mechanistic over scientific application. It's not that science is bad. It's science as Aristotle correctly pointed out has its place and should not get out of its place or we will make big mistakes on the basis of it. Well, then we're lucky we have the Dean of the world uh, <laughs> telling the, this community, this academic community and our audience today at World mm -hmm. Affairs about this inherent conflict and, and really the, the threat uh, that, uh, that it presents, especially as the efficiencies, uh, the pressures for efficiencies grow both in the academic world and the business world, but also are made even more rapid via the new technologies, whether they be the AI technologies or even uh, the potential uh, quantum computing developments, which will think faster than we can think uh, and, and deliver the types of um, outcomes and, out, and, and try to in, uh, move in the types of inputs uh, that, that may in fact uh, create an even accelerated push to this inefficient, non-natural um, model uh, that will, in fact, and does, as you say, and I think rightly, threaten uh, our democratic systems. Let me ask at this point, uh, if you think that there are, because we talked about the past and how the, the governing systems have responded and reacted to some of the pressures, do you think there's anything inherently different in the modern uh, democratic governing systems, not necessarily the people or the parties, but just sort of systemic questions that uh, allow for this unfettered capitalism and focused on efficiency to, to actually be able to, um, has there been state capture, for instance? Is that one of the, the modern day um, uh, characteristics of this, late stage capitalism see I, I there may be i'm not i'm not particularly sort of compelled by that argument mm -hmm. only because i think that those operating in in government have been taught similar things by their own folks uh, about the importance of efficiency Right. So I think if, I, I think you're you're taught that in the courses you take at whatever the Kennedy School or the Woodrow Wilson School or 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 at uh, at uh, Stanford, um, it, you're taught how important it is to be efficient. I would argue that the Washington Consensus uh, is 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 you know kneels at the at, at the feet of uh, efficiency, um, and so so. I, I do. I think businesses kind of lobby to get what they want and to and to fix games for for their benefit. But sure, ab, you know, absolutely, that that that's sort of like almost obvious. Uh, if you look at any uh, numbers or what goes on in, in Washington, way of lobbying. But that's not the. To me, that's not the core problem. The core problem is that that those folks in Washington genuinely believe to a great extent. And I'm not just, and, and by the way, I'm not saying Republicans believe this and Democrats, right. Democrats, I can think, uh, uh, believe it. There, there's just been this, this view that efficiency is great. Now, a Democrat may say, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a, a efficiency with caring and a Republican might say, I'm gonna have efficiency. I'm, I'm not gonna worry so much, so much, who knows? You can, maybe that's too much of a caricature, but if they both think the goal should be maximum efficiency, and it's just how you get it is the difference. We, we, we've, we've lost the war. The war, the, the war has to be fought on the, on the basis of in a real natural system, which is what America is, the world is, a real natural system. Uh, what is the balance of efficiency 
and, uh, uh, and resilience. And I think where, where that you know, kind of worm is turning in some, uh, some substantial way is in environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. Because what, what, what is environmental sustainability, uh, um, you know, if anything, obsessed with? Resilience, yeah. right? Resilience, it's saying, and, it, and it's saying, it may not have framed the argument as a resilience versus efficiency, but, but it is, that is, is what it's saying. It's saying, it's saying we, we may need to give up some things in terms of efficiency that would be otherwise efficient to have a resilient planet, one that's gonna be around for our, for our children. So I, I, think, I think that is, that is sort of the early warning kind of science. It's a canary in the coal mine for the domination of efficiency. Right. Efficiency as a movement should be, should be looking at the environment and saying, ooh, yeah. there's a lot of people who aren't buying my theory. Uh, now they may be young, and they may be Swedish, and they, they may, whatever, you know, young Swede, uh, but that's a canary. Mm -hmm. That's a canary, and a, in, a good, in, a, in a good way. I'm not into canaries dying, but uh, it's the, the metaphor, the canary in the, in, in the, in the coal mine. And, and, I, and I, just, I just also, also think that, uh, uh, though I don't want to make it out as though millennials and Gen Zs are completely and utterly different than, than anything that's come before. I mean, we've been through the 60s, like there were, there were, there were, there were, there were, there were things, and I'm, I'm waiting to see how millennials are going to be when they're 40 and 50, and same with Gen X. That having been said, it feels as though they have more of a sense that, that there needs to be resilience. Even in their interpersonal, they, they, I mean, I remember this from the Rodman School, sometimes it's almost cringing when our students would ask recruits questions about work-life, home-life balance. Right. Right. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I guess I'm from the generation that would, would have said, are they, are they going to, are they going to be, you know, have a big X, X through their, their, their resume? Hope, hopefully not. But that's a resilience question. Yeah. Right. It like, it's, that's fundamentally a resilience question. Am I balancing these two things in a way that will make my family life uh, more sustainable? So, so I, I'm optimistic that there are cracks forming in the domination of efficiency uh, machine, perfectible machine efficiency as the dominant way of conceptualizing what we should do and what is better rather than worse. Right. Uh, before we go on, I just want to remind those who are viewing us today uh, that there is a Q&A button at the bottom. I'll go through these and, and either incorporate them or ask them outright from, uh, from our audience. Um, you know, you mentioned in this uh, discussion on resilience uh, that in, and this holistic system, this natural system, um, I, I see two things happening. One is that what you're advocating for is a, a change in the way that we, not, not you and I, but we as a, as a populace, and I know from your book that you're advocating for educators, for politicians, for industry leaders, to all give this shift a chance to, to actually look at where this difference uh, of looking at things from a mechanistic perspective should be changed to being perceived of as this natural system because it, it, it has functioned. It does, uh, it is the operating system, if you will, of how the world works. Uh, and yet we've lost sight of that a little bit in, at the altar of efficiency. Um, so my, my question really is then, if this is a global holistic system, must we also then look to uh, look to these types of um, models to be applied around the world, uh, especially as our economies globalize, as our trade, uh, well, not currently, but has uh, up until recently uh, moved towards, towards open, free, and at times borderless trade. Um, how do you reconcile the fact that there are differing systems, differing approaches, yet the economic system tends to become even more intertwined and interconnected. Sure. Well, I, I would say on balance, I'm happy that there is such diversity, right? Because if you're if you're thinking about a, a, 
a system that can't be perfected, but can just be made better, having lots of data points out there that says, well, well, hmm, that jurisdiction is trying that, that jurisdiction is trying uh, this, uh, this other thing, um, gives us more, I think, rich sources of ideas uh, for, for what, we, what, what we could do. So I like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I, I do think that the interconnectedness of the world uh, is is a challenge, and I'm probably you know against you know, most most of my most of my peers in in saying I I would make no effort to make the world more connected than it than it is now from a trade from a trade standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I I think we're only now coming to understand the downsides of more op open trade. The brilliant, and if you haven't had him on yet, Danny Rodrigue, uh, at, uh, the Harvard uh, economist, uh, has has you know, done some great work on just saying, "Hey, the losses to particular uh, elements of uh, you know of the labor markets are persistent and and large. Let's not be Pollyanna-ish about about saying because of the gains of trade, because of David Ricardo, uh, you know, it'll it'll always be always be better." So so. I, I'd be more, more of an advocate of going slow on any more, more of that and observing the things that individual countries have been doing that are working to better have a balance of resilience and, and efficiency and, uh, uh, and adopting what we see as the, the best ideas out there. Right. And you and I actually had a chance to talk uh, earlier about some of those good examples, and you uh, spend a lot of time in Denmark. Maybe you can uh, give us an example of how they actually are functioning to prevent the types of um, of uh, business challenges uh, through structural, uh, unique structural uh, functions that that exist within that yeah. business climate within that society, and in Scandinavia in general. Yeah. No. I mean, in some sense, what what the big Danish companies do uh, would be considered grossly inefficient by sort of capital market theorists. And what that is, is, uh, you know, if, if you can think up an, uh, the name of a global uh, Danish leader of which there are, there are many, uh, the chances are probably 80% eight, eight, 90% probability that they're owned in part by a, a uh, uh, foundation, a charitable foundation. So the great Novo Nord Nordisk, uh, Novo Zymes, uh, AP Muller, Maersk, uh, Lego, Grunfoss, Danfoss, co companies that are all number one uh, in the world in their, in their uh, thing, you couldn't possibly take them over. Right. Like just don't even try because the foundation would say sort of like, you know, get out of my face uh, and there would be no chance. Now, capital market aficionados would say, well, then that, that's an inefficiency. You want them to be taken over and fixed and whatever, but they're doing great. They're doing great. And that to me is an example of how you haven't understood completely the system dynamics effect of having packs of hyenas, you know, activist hedge funds, they're packs of hyenas going around and terrorizing all the animals while they're grazing and, and the like that, you know, that's not, that's not sustainable. Well, that's what's happened. There's packs of hyenas terrorizing all the companies uh, in, in the U S and supposedly that's going to make them more effective, mm -hmm. right? No, they're scared, right? They're running scared. They're looking over their shoulder all, all, all the time. The Danish giants uh, kind of are not. And I also like Sweden. We talked about Sweden where I know you've spent a bunch a bunch of time, clever, clever kind of tax regime. I love the Swedish tax, tax re regime. What they say is, is it's a, it's a privilege to live in this fine country. We're going to make it a fine country with great healthcare, great education, uh, kind of a, a equality, great de de democracy, care for the environment. And, you know, for that privilege, we're going to tax you uh, personally at a high level. Mm -hmm. But do they say that to the companies? No, they say to the companies, uh, your job is to create high paying jobs in the country and we'll tax the person in that in that job, not to create jobs overseas because tax rates are lower for you overseas. They'll be low here, create your jobs here uh, and we're, we're fine with that. It's, it's taking sort of intelligent views that say it's a system. You can't just say, say what's our corporate income tax regime in and of itself. 
with no relation to all the other pieces of the of the puzzle. So I, I think there, there are examples. Do I think Sweden is perfect and Denmark is perfect? No, no, nothing is perfect. <laughs> nothing is perfect. But do they offer opportunities for you to say, ah, I could tweak, I could tweak the system in that direction and see see what that uh, gets me. So, do you think that there are any inherent um, advantages for those nations and uh, those systems that seem to be more homogenous or more ethnically aligned? For instance, if there are advantages in Japan's system of of uh, corporate survival uh, via their their societal responsibility or the Danish Swedish model versus or even China for that matter where the dominant Han culture uh, is able to make decisions that are uh, sweeping and and nationwide in, at any point versus of course our cacophonous multi-ethnic <laughs> diverse uh, environment and polity here in the United States? Well, I mean, I guess at, at my heart, uh, you know, uh, Mark, I'm a competitive strategy a guy. Um, and and what, what I'd say is, is you need to take your, your basic endowment of capabilities and figure out how to maximize them as opposed to saying, I wish they were like that other, that other person, person's is to maximize my, and I'm not, I'm not saying you're saying that, but I would say, I would say that Japan has done a good job of, of maximizing the, the outputs, the outcomes, the accomplishments of a isolationist island, island uh, state, right? And, and, they, and they've done a, they, I, like, Who's not to like uh, kind of what they what they've managed to do? I, I mean, I didn't like them being an Axis power, but since then, since yes. then, as yeah. a democracy, I like what Sweden and, and Denmark have done. But that's there is an argument that says that's a bit easier task. They're sort of bite-sized countries that are that are more homogenous. But I think America has got a, an awesome opportunity to 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 show what that that heterogeneous. Uh, uh, kind of big heterogeneous uh, country can can uh, do, but it can't do it the same way these these more homogenous uh, countries do it. But I, it doesn't. It it is not cause for discouragement of uh, of of mine. For no, you you are an optimist both on this uh, webcast and in your book, and so uh, you devote the majority of this book to solutions. And so maybe some of the bigger ones that you think might be helpful for those who are viewing right now, uh, maybe you could touch on some of those and regardless of whether you're talking about industry or academia or, or government. Sure, so yeah, I'll pick, a, pick out a few, maybe one, one, one per, per uh, jurisdiction. Like, so for, for, for government, the biggest and most important thing I think it can, it can do is to write revision, the requirement for revision into every legislation it passes. Mm -hmm. right? So in a complex adaptive system, you cannot tell in advance what the unintended consequences of your actions are. Right. We, we just run straight into that buzzsaw by making virtually everything permanent, mm -hmm. right? Um, it shouldn't be, and it's doable. Canada's most important financial services legislation, which would be like as big a legislation as lots and lots of US financial services legislation all pulled together is the Bank Act. Mm -hmm. It was passed in uh, 1871, four years after the, the foundation of Canada as a country. And they wisely put, in, put into the legislation a requirement. This isn't, a, this isn't a, you should do this. This is an absolute requirement to do a formal, a very formal review of it and revision to it every 10 years. Right. Um, so it's doable. Right. right? So the and, things you say and, in the book is if we do things very similar to the way that we look at our judicial system in our legislative system. In other words, yeah. yes, have a document that's foundational, um, have regulations and rules and laws, but allow for those to, um, to adapt, to really meet the moment, as it were. Yeah. In fact, more so than allow, like embrace, <laughs> embrace it. Yeah, re require and embrace it. It's a yeah. good thing, not a not a uh, not a bad thing. So that that's what I would say for government. If they could if they could do one thing, that would that would be it. For businesses, I, I think the number one thing would be this 
eliminate the, from their mind the notion that Slack is the enemy. It's the enemy that should be eliminated. Because right. uh, that's this just uh, it. It isn't uh, even Ed, Ed, W. Edwards Deming, the father of quality management, who talked about how to get waste out of your system, said there's always an optimal level of slack, and it isn't zero. We're treating it like zero, uh, and we've just got to wake up and smell smell that uh, particular uh, coffee. Um, for educators, I really think kind of the the key thing is to stop teaching. Uh, a certainty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, top temper your inclination to say we can teach certain things because there just aren't many certainties, right? Just the way we test, there's a right answer and a whole bunch of wrong answers on a multiple choice question. Uh, you know, there are just better answers and worse answers, and students should should be educated to believe that no matter how good their answer is, you can be Sir Isaac Newton, right? one of the smartest dudes that's ever walked this planet. <laughs> and we teach it like his laws are the truth, mm -hmm. right? For over a century. Yeah. Until a patent clerk who didn't wear socks came along and said, mm, you're mainly right, Isaac, Sir Isaac, uh, you know, Einstein, you're, you're, you're mainly right, uh, but not, but here's, here's a way to be right -er. We should be teaching that, not teaching, teaching certainty. And finally, for citizens, just utilize your purchasing power more intelligently, I would say, right? So there's been a tendency uh, for, people, for people to fall in love with a provider of things like, you know, all the things you, sh you shop for, Amazon Prime, uh, how you get around, Uber, uh, how you get your newsfeed, uh, Facebook. And what the individual consumers are not recognizing is the degree to which when they give all of their uh, 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 all of their purchases to one player, they're making that player stronger in, and in doing so, causing others to do the same thing to a greater extent. And then they wonder why they wake up with a monopoly, right? right? If instead consumers just were a little more rigorous about saying, if I like Amazon Prime best, I'll spend 50% of my purchases on Amazon Prime and then some my local store, some a chain store, some on a different online. I'll take Uber some of the time. I'll take taxis uh, and, and Lyft other times. I'll, I'll get my Facebook uh, news feed, but I'll sub subscribe to the Miami Herald uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other, other uh, online uh, sources. That would break down this, this inclination towards these extreme outcomes that are not resilient. Um, and it wouldn't be all that uh, hard or painful. For, so th that, that would just be four of the 18 that I, that I lay out in the back half of, uh, of the book. And note, all of them are things that have already been done, right. are being done, are successful. It's just there are not enough of them uh, uh, happening. Right. And, and for them to be successful, they all have to sort of take place as well. It, it can't just be the one or the other. There has to be this sort of universal understanding uh, of this, of our system, our economic governing system, our, our democratic capitalist system as, uh, as a holistic system that requires participation at every level, that, that one sector can't profit financially I'm just thinking of, uh, okay. while the other suffers. Um, okay. uh, otherwise, it really doesn't find its balance, uh, to use your uh, natural metaphor. Absolutely. Economic system. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, if we said Washington's got to fix this, it ain't going to be fixed. If we say the business roundtable's got to fix this, it ain't going to be fixed. Uh, it, it's, going to t it's going to take multiple players to tweak the system and bring us back from a brink that I think we are heading towards. I, I, I think we are heading towards a brink and the brink is, is the populace losing faith in democratic capitalism to provide the best thing for them, their family, it's the, the best system. And that would be, in, in my view, a horrible shame. A horrible well, and shame. there's plenty of messaging coming from other nations as well that this uh, this system should fall apart, should break. 
uh, that in fact um, they would prefer to uh, be the new ones to write the rules of the game uh, in the United States and North America and other uh, democratic capitalist states that in fact there would be no love loss in fact it would be uh, an inevitable from their perspective uh, change in the guard of, of global leadership and I think most specifically of China which does not look at our system as one that is either resilient or a, uh, necessarily adaptive because of the pressures that are being put on uh, on the system globally and that in fact something that is much more authoritarian in nature uh, much more decisive and and has some level of collective understanding uh, is preferable. How do you deal with that question and that challenge uh, to not only the inherent problems that we have within our own system, but the fact that there are external pressures pushing us towards this breaking point? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm glad you, you talked about China in that respect, because it is it is the the great sort of kind of model challenger uh, uh, for us. Right, we we had the, a model challenger in the Soviet Union for a while. It's like this model, that, and the the U.S. model prevailed. We had we had uh, Japan. I mean, it may seem old now, but in the, during the '80s, there was a question of whether Japan would surpass the, the U.S. And I think nobody argues that uh, that anymore. So the latest challenger uh, uh, is China, and and so there is a battle on between totalitarian capitalism and democratic capitalism. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's in part, uh, part of the motivation for writing the book. I, I think unless we can make democratic capitalism work better, right, it may be defeated right, uh, by uh, authoritarian or totalitarian uh, uh, capitalism. Because I think the, Chine the Chinese have wisely figured out that, that communistic uh, uh, running of the economy uh, didn't didn't work and so they've loosened loosened up over the last you know 30-ish years they've uh, they've dramatically loosened up the, the state ownership of everything and and created a more capitalist is it as capitalist obviously not but a more capitalist system and it's worked pretty darn well uh, uh, for them Though, I mean, if you ask the, the, the test, you know, how many, uh, how many Americans would give up citizenship permanently to take up Chinese citizenship, you know, I, I think the answer is, the answer is not, not many. Lots would go to China and work in China and whatever, but they keep that U.S. passport in their pocket, in their, in their, in their pocket. And, and the reason is, I think, um, Americans do, in a super important way, cling to the, the wonders of democracy and believe in, in democracy. And so that's why I'm passionate about, we've got to make democratic capitalism work, which gets into all the challenges you said, it's a heterogeneous pluralist kind of, kind of, uh, kind of wild and wacky kind of electorate, right? right? We, we've, some, we've somehow got to harness that. And that's harnessed best, I think, when the, we have a system where the median family moves smartly forward we ask more from the rich, uh, rich families to make the lives of the poor families both better and provide the tools for mobility for the, for the, uh, for the poor families, like access to education and healthcare and, and the like. That's, that's the system that will be resilient and su uh, sustainable. And we haven't paid enough attention to the sustainability and resilience of that system. And that's that's the threat, and that's the real threat. Yeah, vibrant middle class, you know, promise of social mobility, uh, the ability to actually have faith, trust, belief, the system can be adaptable, can uh, deliver uh, in, through both its uh, economy and through its uh, governing systems to the average citizen. And that is a seemingly simple, Yet, uh, yet challenged uh, formula today uh, as, uh, as we look at all of these pressures that you've discussed uh, both today and, and in your book. Yep. Um, are, there, are there any sort of other things that we should have touched on that we've missed that, that you'd like to bring up before we close out today's session? You know, 
actually no. Uh, for what it's worth, I say I think you you've you've covered the the themes of the book, you know, in in your own unique way, which I which I like. You have not just march through them in the order of the chapters, but uh, so uh, so uh, I I'd, I'd say no. I think you you've covered the waterfront, and I would just want to leave people with the with that what you said earlier. I am optimistic. There is for sure work to be done, but I'm optimistic it it uh, can be done. Well, thank you, Roger. And I see why you have received all these accolades in the past and why they're keeping you employed, even though you're emeritus uh, with all of these business schools. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting moment. We're going through our election transition, of course, and, and the course of the next administration, I think, has articulated that it would like to uh, adapt. and uh, adopt transition, clearly uh, a, uh, a completion of a vaccine that can be distributed uh, certainly wide will also allow us to get through the current crisis. But the current crisis may actually as well provide opportunities for us to rethink and perhaps uh, think about these, uh, these transitions to more natural, complex, adaptive systems that you so eloquently describe in your book. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, to those of you who have joined us today, I incorporated some of your questions into uh, the dialogue. Uh, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's program. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, we encourage you to pick up Roger's book. Yet again, here it is, Where More Is Not Better and um, available at your local bookstores and online. But you know, if you can skip Amazon Prime, do. Uh, <laughs> on Wednesday, November 18th, please join World Affairs for the Global Citizens Awards, the annual fundraising event. Uh, this year, World Affairs is celebrating individuals who have taken bold action on climate change, and in doing so have helped increase awareness of the issue and move the conversation forward. Make sure to RSVP at the World Affairs website. Uh, earlier that day, we'll host a virtual program with vice reporter Paola Ramos. Uh, we will dive into what it means to be a Latina in the United States and the evolution of Latinx identity. Uh, this should be a captivating conversation, so we hope you can make it. Have a great rest of your week, and thank you again, Roger, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. For the World Thank Affairs, you. I'm Marcos Kunalakis.